we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. We're excited to talk about Nemesis. If you didn't you know, join us yesterday at Arsenal, we're glad we can share a little bit more now. A uh, little few introductions. My name is Lee Christensen. I'm a security researcher here at SpectreOps. I have a background in pen testing and red teaming and software security. So kind of a culmination of a lot of that knowledge has kind of led into what Nemesis is now. I'll let my coworkers here introduce themselves too. Hey, I'm Max. I'm a, a consultant, offensive security consultant in SpectreOps. And I'm Will. I'm HarmJoy on Twitter, GitHub, all, the, all that fun stuff. I normally have a beard, so that's why I've had people do, uh, do double takes. All right, so Nemesis. Nemesis, what is it and why did it come to be? So to start off, we want to talk about some challenges that we have in the red teaming industry, especially on some larger teams. So first one is tradecraft is difficult to scale. So we have a, a fairly large red team, uh, you know, 20 to 30 people, and it just keeps growing. And every operator has their own skill sets. And, you know, tradecraft, new tradecraft is coming out every single week. And so when a new technique comes out, how do you transfer that knowledge of that new technique or that new piece of tradecraft across all of your operators? And so that's one of the difficult things is we want to try and make, stay up to date, but also transfer that knowledge throughout the entire team as a whole. Another big problem is offensive data is not unified. So we use a lot of different tools when we do our assessments. As a simple example, there are several different kind of C2 frameworks out there. So you may have heard of Cobalt Strike, Mythic, Nighthawk, Brute Retell, all these different agents you might be interacting with. And the problem is, is their data is all siloed inside of those specific applications. So uh, you may have, for example, you may have multiple agents running on a single host reporting the same information, but it's siloed off into two separate like databases. So it's uh, what we want to do is like aggregate that data and create a single view of what's going on in the network. Another kind of challenge that we have is file and tool output triage is tedious and inconsistent. So I would say for anybody who's done red teaming and pen testing, you've probably done file share mining. And it's probably, there's always value in doing that. So like 70, 80, 90% of the time, you're going to find something valuable, whether that's you learn about how the network is structured, maybe you find a document that has passwords in it, maybe it's just architecture of how the, the, the network is structured. So there's a lot of really good value there, but you're having to sift through thousands and thousands and thousands of documents. And sometimes maybe something you find on the second day of an assessment isn't relevant, but three weeks later, when you come back to it, like when you have more context about the environment, that information is very relevant. But you may have forgot about it, or maybe it was stored in a different format that's not searchable, so like a docx or something. So we want to try and uh, one of our goals with Nemesis is to address this. Even though this triaging is very tedious, it's very manual, let's see if we can automate some of that and uh, ease the analysis for the operator. Um. So with all these issues that we you know, see in red team operate, modern red team operator, operations, uh, we kind of have an elevator pitch for this, this tool that we're interested in. It's a centralized data processing platform that ingests, enriches, and performs analytics on offensive security assessment data. So uh, we think that this will solve the issues of uh, uh, you know, scaling tradecraft, uh, this issue with data unification, and uh, you know, it helps us improve our, our file triage ability. Um, so, so that's the problems that Nemesis uh, kind of you know, was sparked by, right? There's the general goal for what we want to do with it. So what it actually is, so it's Kubernetes, which makes people laugh every time I say it, because I know the, all the memes about Kubernetes. But the reason we chose this for a base architecture is that we wanted something that could be run locally on like a VM with maybe you know 10, 12 gigs RAM. So not insubstantial, but you know, it's uh, nothing like super, super crazy. But we also wanted something that could scale. So we wanted an architecture that we could deploy to a cloud-based environment, whether GCP, AWS, or whatever else, and we could scale horizontally and vertically for compute and storage. So that's the reason we chose this. Um, there's a lot of moving pieces here. I'm gonna highlight some of them. Um, but as far as actually using Nemesis, you don't have to know how all these pieces work. 
So to start, we have a bunch of connectors for different command and control frameworks, OSD stage one, uh, Cobalt Strike, Mythic, Metasploit. We also have Sliver in there, it's just not on the chart. And we have a Chrome plugin. So these things will take data, whether it's downloaded files or other structured types of data. I'm gonna use files as an example. That file will automatically get posted to a front end API that's the core way that you interact with Nemesis. Uh, a metadata message is also submitted that gives you things like the file location, original size, things like that. One thing is when these things post data to Nemesis, you have to supply a certain set of metadata that we have well-defined, which is like operator ID, engagement ID, uh, time is ingested, and an expiration. So some of the questions we've had about Nemesis is, are you keeping this data long-term and all these types of things? So we built into the structure of it that there's actually the ability to prune and expunge data because every single data point in the end is tagged with an expiration like by design. So that data and those messages are first the file will get put into a data lake, which can either be min.io, which is a storage, it's an S3 compatible storage local to the cluster, or Amazon S3 if you want. We do proper KMS, crypto, all that kind of stuff. Uh, then a message gets posted to RabbitMQ, which is a queuing system. These different types of data have different types of messages. Everything's rigidly defined in front of us. So as these messages go through, they get enriched. So if it's a .NET assembly, which is an example we like to use, you know, the source code, will it'll be decompiled to source code, it'll be checked for deserialization, you get all metadata and like type refs and things pulled out and all that type of stuff. As, it, as this data, whatever it is, flows along the pipeline, at the end, it gets put into Elasticsearch in a semi-structured form for a very flexible ease of, ease of search, and it gets put into Postgres in a highly structured form, which we'll talk about why that matters in a bit. Um, the way you actually, and the way an operator interacts with Nemesis is they just, these connectors are set up. Some of the connectors, depending on the C2, will actually give like data tagging or information back to the interface, depending on what it is, and we'll show this in the demos. The main ways you uh, an analyst can interact with this is there's a Kibana, a bunch of custom Kibana like dashboards and stuff that you can search all that kind of semi-structured data. And we have a dashboard application which lets you do um, interesting things on the structured side that we're gonna show. All right, so we're gonna go and get into the demos. Uh, so we have a Cobalt Strike connector. Now we're downloading a .NET assembly. We see back here, it gets auto-ingested into Nemesis, it gets processed, and there's some information that comes back saying, oh, this has deserialization. Uh, if we switch over, we change the color scheme so it's proper black and white hackery type stuff, I promise. Um, but we have, a, you know, we have our process files. This is the main interface, and we see these downloaded files. We see like where it came from, path, you know, time, magic types, and we have tags. One of the tags is deserialization. Also, we have like comments and triage and all these things are tracked as you're going through stuff. Um, some of the things, it depends on the file type, but you can like view the file in Kibana, you can download the file itself. Um, depending on the file type, you can view it in the browser. We can also download the source code for .NET automatically. So this is something, you know, we all could do this, right? This is nothing crazy, but it happens for every single .NET assembly that goes through, every single file. It'll automatically detect if it's an assembly and do all this. So we just have our source code. We got our basic little toy deserialization example, but we were alerted to this and we have all the raw source so you don't have to manually run stuff through dnlib or, or you know, dnspy and that type of stuff. Um, if we go into Kibana, we can see some of the additional metadata for this particular file. It links us straight there. We see, you know, we have all of our metadata, things like that. We have our deserialization results as far as the specific gadget that's used. Um, you, we've got links for the extracted source and all that type of stuff. We have all of our hashes. We have any metadata that can be ripped out, and this varies by file. And it's nice with Elastic because it's like a NoSQL style approach. The data just gets thrown in. Then we have like our function names, type refs, and all this, you know, signing, you know, product info, all that kind of stuff. This happens for every single .NET assembly or every single other type of file, right? It's not just this. This is one of dozens and dozens of types of files that it handles. And now I could search across any of these fields across every assembly that had been downloaded for the entire engagement. All right, now we're gonna do the next demo with Max. All right, so for this demo, we're, we're kind of, uh, we made a Chrome plugin that will automatically ingest data that you uh, download through Chrome into Nemesis. So uh, we'll start by configuring it. We have an agent ID. Like we said, uh, everything is tracked. We want to know which operator, who's actually submitting these. So we're tracking that information. Uh, we also have an allow list down here. So when you're proxying traffic into a network, uh, you know, if you find some sort of file share, like internet file share, like Google Drive, SharePoint, something like that, 
you can uh, specify just that URL, so not everything you download is being ingested in, and processed by Nemesis. Uh, I'm simulating here a you know some sort of file share. Hopefully, no one's running a Python 3 HTTP server in their environment, but maybe. Uh, but this is just kind of a demo to show when we download this docx file, and pay attention, it's docx. Uh, we go to the files tab, and then we can see this file was downloaded and ingested by Nemesis. Uh, we have some information about where it came from and magic type information like that. Uh, like Will showed, we have we can re-download this file, uh, view this file in Kibana, uh, which I'll show off in a second. Uh, view the file in the browser, which it's a docx, it just comes up as trash, and then viewing the file as a PDF. So uh, it will automatically convert, you know, no one wants to open up uh, Microsoft Word and, you know, look at the file, you know, we don't know what's sitting there. Uh, but if we still want to see the file, you know, we have it in PDF form, so we can do all of this through our browser, you know, no going to other applications, it's all done in the browser. We can see here, uh, it's linked in Kibana. We have things like the extracted plain text URL. So if we can view it in a PDF form or we can uh, view it in plain text form, which allows us to perform search queries uh, on the information we want. So if we have some sort of internal host, if we download documentation from like Confluence, let's say, and you know we're, we're searching for a very specific host name, uh, we can search for the host name uh, you know, using some sort of semantic search and uh, you know, learn what documentation we need to read in order to, to learn more and you know, exploit this host or whatever. All right, also some of the stuff that's cool, uh, additional for the document processing, that's not just docx, it's any office document. All the plain text is automatically extracted using a service called Apache Tika. It gets in, run through embeddings and you do semantic search and all that, but the text is also just indexed into Elastic. So every single, Picture through OCR or Office document that can be processed automatically gets all of that pulled out. And you can search across the text of every document that's been downloaded for the entire engagement. Now we're gonna talk about some deep API. So this is Chrome or any Chromium-based browser. So for people that are familiar with deep API or Chrome, you have like a local state that has a key that's protected by the data protection API. That local state key is used to encrypt cookie values and like login data values for Chromium databases. And then that local state that it's protected by something called the DP API or DP API master keys. So these are protected by a user password and a domain backup key for domain context. So we're going to download all those as well. And all these things are automatically being processed in the back end uh, for Nemesis. So we have a DP API as well as a Chromium tab. We see we have logins and this type of stuff that's been processed. I promise we're going to build a better UI. You, everyone can blame me for this. We have our we have encrypted logins, so they're not decrypted yet because we don't have the ability to crack open the master key, right? So we can by by default it won't show that, but you know you can you can show everything with filtering. Now we're going to run uh, Sharp Deep API to get the domain backup key. This is automatically scraped by the Cobalt connector and automatically ingested into Nemesis. Now this domain backup key is linked to the master keys. The master keys are linked to the state key, and the state key is then linked to all the cookies and logins, and all this decryption happens automatically. Forward or backward, it doesn't matter what order you download the files in. Everything just gets ripped apart. Uh, we also have like alerting in Slack and things like this. So when things get like decrypted and that type of stuff, you know, stuff just like pops up and you can get Slack alerts and we'll integrate additional uh, services for alerting as well. You also have the ability to manually submit keys uh, whether it's like you know user passwords, machine master, machine DP API system master keys, things like that. Uh, next one. Just press uh, escape. Oh, all right, on crypto stuff. Um, so often we'll run across files that are encrypted. You know PDFs, docx, zips, things like that. Um, Nemesis will detect if these files are in an encrypted form and automatically extract a John the Ripper compatible hash out of them. These hashes get re-ingested into the pipeline and one of the enrichments that we have for hash types is we automatically try to crack them with the 10,000 most common passwords. And then we alert if that actually happens or not. So we see in the file thing, oh, this is encrypted. And there's actually a Slack alert in the background that went out saying like, oh, this file's encrypted, but we cracked it. Because if we actually go to the hash tab, we see it's password123bing, and we can have the, the hash value being extracted. 
Uh, in the future, we don't have this now, but it'd be super easy to extend the connection to say like, let me feed all these hashes into a GPU accelerated rig as long as you had a queuing system. It's just you write a small service that pulls in from the queue for that RabbitMQ queue for this particular thing that's all well-defined and it could just shoot those values back off. Yep. Can you, can you mangle? Sorry. Oh, so you, you could do whatever you wanted. So we basically just, we have a service. The question was, um, can you do additional like password mingling rules and those types of things? So right now is more as a proof of concept of we're just trying these 10K against that. We have a small John the Ripper instance that's running as a microservice. So you can modify that to, to be whatever you want. Or you could write, an ex you could do a Hashcat service or have something offline or whatever else. It's very extendable. It's just taking the data and just proof of concept trying to do that base, that base extraction. All right, so the last collector we're gonna show off is a, a BOF registry key collector. So we implemented a pretty simple, just registry key collector uh, uh, using a BOF. We're grabbing, would you pause it for a sec? Um, we, we serialize the data. Yeah. So we serialize the data uh, and then return it back to uh, Cobalt Strike as a file so that Nemesis can pull that data uh, deserialize it and put it in structured form into uh, the Nemesis engine. So here we're grabbing uh, the services, current control set services uh, through this, this collector. Uh, you can see it uploads a file, Nemesis grabs it and uh, submits that for processing. Uh, what's really cool is we have the structured data. We're now able to, uh, it gets ingested into Postgres. So now we can perform SQL queries against our, our registry uh, objects. We can see it returns down here, has our current control set services and all the values associated. That data is reprocessed back through that RabbitMQ pipeline. And there's, uh, that information is uh, extracted into services. So services are built on top of that uh, current control set services path. Uh, so once those keys are uh, go back into uh, RabbitMQ and are reprocessed, uh, we restructure the data and make it uh, uh, put it in the services table uh, in a more uh, interesting format. So uh, what's really cool about this this kind of style is you can also ingest raw hives. Uh, you know we did this through BOFs, but you can also do it through raw hives. Ingest raw hives into Nemesis, process them, uh, and so no matter how you perform this collection. It'll always go into the services table uh, and then the registry table uh, when it's when it's processed. All right. So why does this matter? Well, this this idea of you know taking data from several different sources and putting it into a pipeline and enriching it it's not new. So data scientists, data engineering teams have been doing this for a really long time. However. Our field, red teaming, pen testing, really hasn't uh, taken advantage of this, you know, technique yet. So we're really excited about that because it's going to permit allow us to do tons of automation, as you've already seen. This isn't even everything it does. This is just some highlights. It does a lot more underneath, and it's also going to really allow us to do a lot in the future beyond just automation and enrichment. So. Uh, one of the, the big reasons we're doing this is so that we can start building out, you know, our own data lake around offensive data. So as we're performing assessments, we'll be able to get this and then perform analytics and additional things in the future uh, to help us in our assessment. So it's going to enable a lot more research into offensive engagements, which we're really excited about. Yeah, so some of the advantages we see with Nemesis. Um, I think the biggest one, the most important one here is uh, we can easily update uh, the workflow for all of our operators kind of at the same time. And these uh, enrichments and analytics are exist, you know, once they're added, they exist in perpetuity for all operators and all operations. So if we have, uh, you know, we have, let's say we have an assessment, uh, the person who's really good at SCCM is not available to like teach us. If we have these enrichments, we have these workflows already built out for us, we can utilize uh, that expertise and apply it to all of our operations uh, for all of our operators at the same time forever. Uh, we can do, once this data is in a database, we can do file processing offline 
uh, after an engagement is finished to see, uh, you know, for things like research or, you know, anything, anything of that sort. And it minimizes this style of making collectors uh, and then bringing them into Nemesis for analysis allows us to um, minimize the footprint of what's actually happening on the CPU on the target. So most of the ways uh, tools work these days, uh, or for now, is it performs processing, it does the collection and performs processing on the host and returns through standard out uh, information that's useful for the operator. Uh, with this kind of new collection and then analysis offline uh, kind of mechanism we have, we're, uh, there's nothing that happens on the host except for collection, you know, running some Win32 API uh, functions and then data exfiltration. And then all the analysis happens uh, on our side. So those are the advantages we see. So also just a little bit kind of on feature plans. Uh, one of the really cool things we didn't really kind of touch on that we see as a vision going forward is the ability to do more complex analytics on this offline data. So the first canonical example we want to do is power up, power up style privilege escalation on offline data. Because once we collect all these things about services and whatever information we have, we pull it in a raw form, process it, construct those service abstractions based on the reg keys and all that. We'll be able to have analytic services that can analyze it and say, is this thing misconfigured or not? And that's just the start. There's going to be a lot of different things we can do along those lines. Um, the analytics part is not in Nemesis yet. It will be landing in the 1.0.0 release that we'll have in the next, hopefully, few weeks, a month or so, something in, kind of in that time frame. We wanted to get the code out by Black Hat so we can kind of get the word out and talk and get interactions and talk with people about this. All the code is open source. It got pushed yesterday morning, so just over 24 hours ago. This is a, a Bitly style link for it. It's on the SpectreOps GitHub. We also did a four to 5,000 word blog post on the SpectreOps um, Medium site. That's that Bitly link right there that goes into a lot more detail. We also have a white paper that we're finalizing that talks about a lot of the modeling issues, the offensive collection issues, and basically kind of a professionalized version of the blog post without memes. So it's actually just, you know, it's a more white papery type thing. But we're really excited to get this out and to talk with people. We've already had a bunch of really interesting conversations in person on Twitter with a lot of people about this stuff. Um, we are going to have uh, someone else hop on at, was it 2.30 here in a second? So if anyone wants to chat, uh, we're going to step aside kind of over here, but like we want to talk about this. We've spent a, we've spent a year working on this project pretty heavily. So it's been it's been a lot of work, a lot of blood, sweat and tears. But if you have any ideas, any criticisms, any feedback, any just want to geek out about data and all that, we we would love to. So thank you.